And um, the Martian obviously is the most likely to happen in the near future. We could do that now. So, so we know, roughly speaking, how to go to Mars. It would require a big investment and I think it would require um, international collaboration. I, I think the most sensible way to mount a Mars mission would be for uh, the US, China, uh, Russia and the EU, essentially the European Space Agency, to, to do it. Um, but we could do that. Interstellar is, I love the film, partly because it was very heavily influenced by Kip Thorne, who's probably the greatest living general relativity theorist, won the Nobel Prize last year uh, for the detection of gravitational waves. So the physics of Interstellar is fascinating. It's a beautiful way of demonstrating relativity and the consequences of relativity. And um, so, but that's a long way off. Uh, interstellar travel is significantly more difficult than interplanetary travel. No, I wouldn't, because um, Mars is not a nice place to be. It is the nicest place other than Earth in the solar system. It is the only place, the only planet that we will ever go to. There, there, is, no, there is no chance of landing on any other planet. Uh, most of the, you know, to the gas giants obviously don't have a surface. Uh, Venus is very inhospitable, uh, inhospitable, and so is Mercury. Um, so, uh, but it requires a certain type of person. I think when you talk about the frontier mentality, um, it's the ultimate frontier. It is incredibly challenging. Uh, and uh, I, I, do, I have the wrong stuff <laughs> for that. I will go when, um, when the Mandarin Oriental build their first hotel <laughs> there, then I will go to Mars. Um, we've done a lot of work on this actually because there will be a time when we have to deflect one. And the easiest way to do it is to detect it early and then you don't have to deflect it by very much. Um, if you detect it late, there's quite possibly nothing you can do. So, so the, we, we have a program, um, a, a near-Earth asteroid detection program, we map them. We have a system where if one of those Earth-crossing asteroids goes through a particular point in space, then we know that there's a high risk or a medium risk or whatever it is, that it, will, that it could hit us the next time round or the next two times round and so on. So if you detect them well in advance, we have the technology now to deflect them. Now, I'm sure we're not alone in the universe because it's big. <laughs> I mean, there are, in the bit we can see, there are two trillion galaxies, um, each with, what, 200 billion, and it's not to a trillion stars. So there will be alien life out there. If I was to guess, and this is a guess, because we don't know, but I would say that, I would guess that microbes would be common and complex multicellular life would be rare and civilizations would be rarer still. And in fact, you can make a, a plausible argument um, based on biology mainly, that there could be a handful of civilizations per galaxy at any one time, perhaps only one on average. And that could be us in our galaxy. In the past decade, it's reusable rockets, I think, undoubtedly. So, so the fact that we can now fly into space, launch, it, well, um, soon, I think, SpaceX will be launching people, hopefully, in the next few months, uh, and then bring that rocket back again, completely transforms the possibilities because it makes it cheap. And um, I remember, I think it was Elon Musk once said, imagine how, I, I flew yesterday from London to Hong Kong, Imagine if when, I, when we all got off the plane, we just blew it up. <laughs> right, imagine how expensive that ticket would be. But that's what we've always done with rockets. We use them once and it's ridiculous. And now we don't. So that, that transforms the economics.